Well, it is good to be among the saints again and to have opportunity to learn, to grow, to try and encourage one another. And uh, this is what we are called to do in the Lord. Uh, we continue pressing on to maturity in Hebrews. And uh, we'll pick up about chapter 9 here shortly. But uh, we, our main point is that there are kind of three things for a child of God to do in maturity, which are draw near to God, you know, take advantage of our priest, hold fast what you have through life with endurance, and consider how to stir one another up to love and to good works, how to encourage, how do we do good among the people of God so that we are the light of the world, so that we are effective in the service of God in the world. We're starting at Hebrews 9, 27 to move into chapter 10, because that's really where the thought begins. But the first thing that we need to establish, and it's down through 10, 18, we need to finish up what was being said before about the law of Moses, the way that that worship was set up, comparing the sacrifice of Jesus once for all to the sacrifices of the law of Moses many times for some. And um, when that is done, then we continue with the idea of uh, draw near, hold fast, and consider but here in Hebrews 9, 27, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ Jesus once for all time. There's a need for us to be sanctified or made clean in uh, the spirit, which happens in the blood of Christ Jesus. And the fact that he is God's king, the anointed, matters. The fact that he is Joshua, the second, not the first, Moses, uh, matters. The fact that we... Uh, also have a body as he had a body matters. That's where the confidence comes from, actually, that allows us to draw near. That he had a body as we have a body. He suffered as we suffer. He's been tested in every way as we are tested. So at Hebrews 9, 27, Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. For since the law has only a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, the law can never, by the same sacrifices continually offered year after year, the law can never make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, wouldn't they have ceased to be offered? Since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins? Well, this is the base. This is the basis of the argument. One of the, the first things in the argument is this idea. We're establishing that the law of Moses never had the ability to take away sins. And now here we're saying, here's one way you can know that. If it were, if it were able to take away sins, then wouldn't they cease offering? Why do they have to offer again? Why does Yom Kippur come around every year? <laughs> you know, why do they have to keep doing this? If it took away sins, why, what, is, what is this for? And if the worshipers, having once been cleansed, had no longer consciousness of sins, if that had been taken away. But in these sacrifices, three or four tell us of Hebrews 10, there is a reminder of sins every year. Not only do they not take it away, they remind you. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. That's a major tenet. The bulls and the goats, the sin offerings is what we mean. They can't actually take away sins. They're there as a form of worship for a time. They're copies or shadows of the reality. What is the reality? Right? Well, the reality is Christ, Hebrews 10, 5 through 9. Therefore, consequently, when Christ came into the world, since bulls and goats won't get it, 
Sacrifices and offerings, he said, you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you have taken no pleasure. Right, this is the Old Testament, which said it very plainly that sacrifices and offerings were not for what God wanted. Burnt offerings and sin offerings gave him no pleasure. That that wasn't it. It's this, a body you have prepared for me. Now there is, I suppose, a symbolic reading of that, which means I'm offering my own service. You know, I am the sacrifice. He wants right living, not offerings to make up for bad living. That's true. But it's actually more than that. We're also saying that Jesus himself is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He is the Lamb. In these bulls and goats, we had no pleasure. They didn't, they weren't effective. In the body of Christ, there is a new preparation, a new Passover lamb. Then I said, continues the quotation, Behold, I've come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. Well, this is a rather pregnant uh, passage in Scripture that shows God was not accepting those old offerings. He prepared a body, and that body showed up to do the volume of the scroll, everything that is written about him. There's something there, something rather large there. Well, it's the life of Christ who came in the flesh, who had a body as you and I have a body and became the sacrifice on the cross for our sins. All of this having been written about in the Old Testament, all the scripture that leading up to this points to him. There are figures of Christ on every page. So Hebrews continues, when he said above, you have neither desired or taken pleasure in sacrifices, offerings, burnt offerings, and sin offerings, which are offered according to the law of Moses. Then he added, behold, I have come to do your will. So we're contrasting the offerings, which is the law, with, behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second, which is a point that Hebrews made earlier. But we're revisiting that point, saying it's clear, even in the, the Psalms themselves, that another law was coming. Another priesthood, not according to Levi, is coming. Uh, and, and here we have, these offerings are not okay. Somebody's buddy, somebody is going to be here to do something new. Behold, I have, come, I have come to do your will. By that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. It's that will of God that makes holy. We have been made holy. Sanctify means made holy, by the way. Sanct is your Latin-based, you know, kind of idea for holy that we borrow in English. But this is made holy. He is holy and we become holy. That's what uh, Peter would quote uh, in the Old Testament. God said, I am holy, therefore ye shall be holy, right? What that means, you, because I am holy, you should become holy. This is the meaning. We are sanctified, that is to say, we are made holy through the offering of the body of that anointed Joshua once for all. <coughs> Our king offered himself, and that has made the rest of us holy. He is that priest. So we contrast this Every Levitical priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. This whole thing is futile, and they knew it. It couldn't actually take away sins. It was just what you had to do for a time, and you had to do it over and over. 
Every day they go to work and slaughter animals all day for people, you know, who may be, should have known better, right, in their way of thinking. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. He's not standing around working for us. <laughs> he is sitting at the right hand of God. He is reigning. He offered and he did it once for all time. He doesn't have to have multiple. That's the idea. His offering is that much better. His priesthood is that much better. He did what he needed to do as a priest once for all. And now he reigns waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. This is a topic that is explored in more detail in 1 Corinthians 15. The last enemy to be put underneath is death. He overcomes sin, he overcomes death. We're saying that Christ is reigning until the end of time. By a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being made holy. So his one offering for all time perfects whoever comes near. Anybody who will be made holy, who will become a Christian, is being made so through that one offering that he made in whatever, 33 AD, let's call it. Furthermore, second point here in the 15th verse, the Holy Spirit also bears witness how is that? Well, through Scripture, as always, the Holy Spirit bears witness too. After he said, this is the covenant I'll make with them, this is Jeremiah, in those days, or after those days, declares the Lord, I'll put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. You know that passage we read earlier from Jeremiah. After he said that, then he added this, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. That's how it was. It was pretty clear. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. No more are there offerings being made that matter for sin before God. One that matters has been made, it's Christ. And the Spirit bore testimony to this. He never spoke basically what we're saying. I'll remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. You didn't read that in Exodus. You didn't read that in Leviticus. Torah makes no such promise. It just tells you what to do when you got it wrong. This comes from the prophets, and it's after those days. I'll make a covenant with them, not like the one I made with their fathers when, they, when I took them by the hand in the land of Egypt at Mount Sinai. No, it's not going to be that kind of law. It's different. This one's in the heart. These are Christians we're talking about. Here we have no remembrance of sins, forgiveness of lawless deeds. That's what you get in Christ Jesus, in the new kingdom, the new priesthood. So all those things add up. That's where we are now. It is all added up to Hebrews 10, 19 and following. And Hebrews 10, 19 and following basically goes like this. We have confidence to, to deal with God and we have a great priest to mediate with God. And these things together mean three conclusions. First one is, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. The second being, let us hold fast our confession. And the third being, let us consider how to stir up one another for love and for good works. But you know, he wouldn't ask us to stir up anything else. But we have confidence and we have a great high priest. And because of this, we should draw near to God. We should hold fast what we have, you know, continue in the faith through life, through trials. And we should consider how to stir up one another. 
That is to say, we're thinking about the service of God. We're thinking about the word of God. We're thinking about the people of God. What can we do? How do we accomplish something here? Well, we'll get to that in a minute. Now, uh, let's draw near. 19th verse, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and the living way that he opened for us through the curtain, which is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, our hearts being sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, our bodies washed with pure water. All right, this is let us draw near. So again, our confidence is a confidence uh, to enter the throne room of grace in prayer that we go to God we're, in some sense, entering the holy places when we pray. And that confidence comes through the blood of Christ. He opened the way into the holiest of holies. Remember when the veil was torn from top to bottom because the veil is his body. When he died on the cross, the veil split in two. His body was the sacrifice, the real sacrifice that actually brought about forgiveness and opened the direct passageway into the holiest of holies, which under the law of Moses was inaccessible, not open. But also we have confidence because we have flesh too. And that's a very important thing. You know, the world really thinks that flesh is inherently evil. That's not true. It's just, you know, an, an empty slate. Um, but it's, it's not true. God himself put on flesh and dwelt among us. And it's very important to understand that he did so. If there's any way, whether it be, you know, uh, immaculate conception, original sin, total inherent depravity, whatever, whatever people have come up with, if there's anything that makes the body of Christ in any wit different from your body or my body. He is not your mediator. That's the important thing. It cannot be. So yes, he had a body. And yes, we have confidence that way too. Now, am I confident that you're going to walk on water? No, no, that's not what we mean. What we mean is it is possible to live right. You can make good choices. You can decide to serve God. And you must. So we have both confidence because of that offering and everything that's written about it, where the Holy Spirit assures and gives testimony, our confidence is rightly placed. And we have a great high priest, a great priest over the house of God. Therefore, we draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. So we draw near to God and we do this with a true heart. The heart is sincere, it's real, this is genuine. This is something I think about a lot, My, personally, on a personal note, I think about that a lot because I spend almost all of the rest of my life in the meta. Um, it, you know, I get in trouble a lot for not being serious. <laughs> and that's my personality. But when it comes to God, this is serious. This is real. This is lasting. This will matter. I'm not going to be a stickler about a lot of things. But when it comes to the word of God, absolutely. It has to be a true heart, the real, genuine, earnest thing. And full assurance of faith. You trust God. You trust what he said. You trust what he did. And therefore, you have confidence and assurance. Our hearts are sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. Our bodies are washed with pure water. This is a reference to baptism for forgiveness of sins. Right? 1 Peter 3, 21 says, it's not the removal of dirt from the flesh. It's the answer of a good conscience. It's an appeal to God for a clear conscience. We've just been reading how that when people in the law of Moses offered bulls and goats, they had to do it again and again and again. It just keeps coming up. 
because their conscience is never clean. Their conscience is never absolved. The sin is never taken away. They aren't taught how not to sin. They're taught how to pay for it when they do. In the law of the Lord, we're taught how not to sin. We're taught how to be and how to make our hearts more like his. And so you can have a clean conscience. And, and again, 1 Peter 3, 21 ties that with baptism. That you, of course, you have to obey what God said in water, but the water is not the cleaning agent. The blood is the cleaning agent. And the thing that's being clean, uh, cleansed is your conscience. You know, your soul, your mind. You are being cleaned. You are being forgiven. This is how you are sprinkled. The way the, the law of Moses was inaugurated with blood on the hyssop and the other sponges and things. We are uh, inaugurated with the blood of Christ. But it actually forgives. Also, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful, implied, will you be faithful? Right? Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. We have a hope in Christ and we confess that hope. We confess that we believe in God, that we trust in God. You confess that by living right, by making the choices you make. I've relayed before a conversation I had with an atheist homosexual man who was my friend at, at a place that I worked before, an open and honest conversation, and he was a very nice fella from uh, Schulenburg, as I recall. Um, but uh, we had this conversation, and, you know, he said, look, I, what I don't understand is why do you, you know, you just hold yourself back from everything that's fun. If I want something, I do it. If, if I like it, it, I do it. That was his rationale. He was a nice fella. He wasn't mad at me or belittling. He was just saying that, you know, you're missing out. You're, you're holding yourself back from all kinds of enjoyment. I'm like, well, I suppose that's true. Um, and that's how you're confessing, you see. Your life is a testimony a confession of Christ in the body. Hold fast without wavering. You have a hope is what we mean. There's a reason to do this. He's saying, well, I don't know why. That's because you don't have the hope that I have. You don't believe that there is something else coming that's worth it. Uh, I've been criticized by philosophers who say, you know, son, you're still a good hedonist. I say, well, what do you mean? He said, well, but you just believe that all the pleasure is in heaven and that that one outweighs everything else. But that's just hedonism. <laughs> and I say, oh, that's interesting. Now, I'm not necessarily sure that they're wrong about that. That might be okay. But it's true. When you're apprised of the truth of the matter, that there is a spiritual and that that is the real and the permanent thing, and that's what matters, and that's the point of this life. Well, yes, heaven is all there is. Hold fast that hope without wavering. He who promises faithful, let us consider also how to stir up one another to love and good works. Consider here is, uh, is you know, watching, thinking about, figuring out, planning. Um, let's see. I didn't put together a good uh, illustration, but this is, you know, the difference between uh, getting a, you know, following a direct order and taking responsibility, right? If somebody gives you a direct order about how to do a thing, then you do precisely those steps and nothing else. That's following orders, yes. It's not really getting done what they intended, right? <laughs> There's a difference, right, between those, whereas if you say, well, you know, we need this thing to be handled. Well, then you handle that thing, and whatever comes up, 
you handle it or whatever you need to accomplish that thing. You think about it ahead of time and you prepare and you get the materials you need to accomplish that thing. Or you make the circumstances ready to accomplish that thing because you're going to accomplish that thing. Right? Without the person telling you, well, you're going to need X, Y, and Z. And in order to get to X, you're going to have to take steps one, two, and three. And you've got to have enough time leading up to that. Right? That's what you do with children because they don't know how to do things. But when you get to be an adult and you, you're working and they ask you to handle something, you handle it. They don't want to have to tell you how to do every little step, right? That's consider. Consider, meaning think about how to accomplish the goal, which may be a lot of different things. And you respond to the situations as they arise. You play it by ear in some sense. But you're always thinking about the goal. In uh, I think it's the Marines who speak of com uh, commander's intent, uh, which doesn't mean they have to stay in the tent with you. That would be awesome if it did. They're pretty humble, but still, that would be awesome. But no, commander's intent means that the people who are on the ground actually know because they have been told verbatim what the intent of the commander was. No matter how many chains of command it had to come down to them, they know what we're trying to do. And that's useful, because if you're trying to take this hill, right, you're on the ground and you're trying to take this hill, but you know that the point of this is we're trying to destroy that base over there. And you see that base blow up. Do you keep marching to the hill? No. You know already. Commander's intent has been accomplished. Abandon this. We don't need to do that. Right? So you're, re you're responding as the situation evolves. This is the meaning here, too. We're considering one another with this idea, stir up to love and to good works. What will it take, right? <laughs> what will it take to encourage you, to help you accomplish what you need to accomplish for the Lord? How do I make it easier for you to do right or encourage you to do right or um, supply you with what you need to do right? And we all do this for each other. That's what it is here. We draw near to God, we hold fast to God, and we are busy with helping each other on. That's the life of the Christian in maturity. Not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Well, it's true. They were to come together. You have to, you know, you have to have interaction with the children of God in order to help each other. Um, I always remember, and I bring it up a lot, I guess, but I always remember the, an, an older woman in, in uh, Fort Worth, actually. Uh, she's gone on, but um, when I was in college and I would come home to visit sometimes, she would ask me what's going on in life, and I would tell her, you know, reluctantly. At some point, she was like, you need to tell me, and I said, I, I really don't want to bother you, sister. I mean, you know, it's just, it's just my stuff, you know, whatever I'm doing. And she said, well, if I don't know what's happening in your life, I don't know how to pray for you. I need to know, what are you doing? What are you trying to do in the Lord? And she was right. She was right. Uh, so I thought of that. This is the meaning. We have to know each other to be able to encourage each other. That doesn't mean that we meddle in other people's affairs. It just means you have to have some knowledge of what's going on. so that you know what to do. You have to know something about the situation so that you know how to intervene. Now, to take that out of kind of lofty language, uh, you know, we've prayed for our sister who's back with us, that's wonderful, uh, after her surgery. And, uh, you know, this recording is going out, so I'm not gonna give names, but <laughs> the, uh, you know, we knew that this was happening and therefore we could pray and be concerned and, and offer assistance and help. And, and there's lots of things like this, right? We, 
We have things that we face in life, troubles that we face. We should share those with each other and bounce ideas with each other so that we can pray for one another. And so we can work towards help. You know, what can I do that would be helpful? How can I offer some thing, whatever it might be, a helping hand, a material, a, an errand, whatever. And all the more as the day draws near, you realize that time's running out. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Well, this is thoroughly mosaic, um, thoroughly mosaical. Um, this is the idea that there are no offerings prescribed in Leviticus that take away intentional sins. Intentional sins always have the penalty of death. There's not an offering for murder. There's not an offering for kidnapping. There's not an offering for rape. Those people are put to death. Those are intentional. He said, if you, get, if you sin deliberately, after you know better, after you receive the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice. Right? Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, is for the things done unintentionally. When people didn't know any better, now they... You know, they're coming, they've come to their senses. It's kind of like their baptism in a sense. You know, now they've come to their senses. Now they've come together in, in uh, Jerusalem and, and they're worshiping and they're listening to the teaching and the high priest and the offering says, that's for the past, you're starting over. And now you make your offerings, right? But after you've done that, you go commit murder, they're going to put you to death. There's no offering for you. And it's the way that it is on the law of Moses, but rather a fearful expectation of judgment. They went there knowing that they were going to have to give answer and they kind of already knew the answer. And I was watching a television program about court TV or one of the, I don't know what it's called. And they said, hey, how come the murderers don't usually, or people accused of murder don't take the stand? And they said, well, because they know they did it and they can't say they didn't. <laughs> oh, really? It's that simple? Yeah. Yeah, that's all. A fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. See, you become an adversary of God if you take that sacrifice, if you start up in the life of God and then you turn to sin and deliberately continue. You become an adversary and you know what happened to God's adversaries in the Old Testament. It is a fearful thing we read Hebrews 10, 28, 31. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. That is true. By the word, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact shall be established. That's what it took to put somebody to death in the law of Moses, where appropriate, you know, for the sins that had death as their penalty. Whoever sets aside that law dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God, who has profaned or made common the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, who has outraged the Spirit of grace? See, there's three things here, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Son of God trampled underfoot. Yeah, that's disrespect to the God who sent him, to God the Father. That's disrespect. Treated as common or profane, the blood of the covenant by which he was made holy. Profane is this, the opposite of holy. He was made holy by this blood, and this blood is an agreement he made with God, but he didn't keep it. He went back to the unholy, the, clean, the uh, unclean, the common, the profane. That blood is the blood of Jesus. He's the one who paid that ultimate price and has outraged the spirit of grace. It's the grace of God that teaches us to deny worldliness and ungodly desires and to live righteously. Titus chapter 2 tells you that. The spirit teaches through the word. We outrage the spirit of grace when we receive that grace in vain. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved 
by the one who has done this. If you set aside the law of Moses. See, we just finished describing how the covenant of Christ is better. Much in every way. The offering is better. The effectiveness of the offering is better. The access to the holiest is better. The life of the priest is better. The citizenry is better. We are royal priests. Everything about it is better. And if you're put to death for setting aside the law of Moses, what's going to happen if you fall away from God as a Christian? You have trampled underfoot the Son of God. You have profaned the blood of the covenant. You have outraged the spirit of grace. What do you think will happen? That's not going to be good. right? That's not good. Don't, you don't need to go to this place. We know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. The Lord said this under the law of Moses, and terrible things happened. Again, the Lord said, the Lord will judge his people. When he said, vengeance is mine, I'll repay, the context was, you know, between each other or really the nation of Egypt. Now, the Lord says, the Lord will judge his people, meaning not just the world. It's not for everybody else. It's for you. Right? We have a habit of thinking that's for everybody else. No, it's for you. The Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It's true. It's a terrifying place to be if you're not living right, if you are not right with God. And with good reason, you should be terrified if you're not right with God. But we are not of those who shrink back in fear. Recall the former days when, after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings. So the church is to whom he is writing. The, the Jews who became Christians to whom he is writing suffered in specific ways. As we know, their property was confiscated or they lost access to their networks and their um, uh, alliances for, for business. You endured a hard struggle with suffering, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, sometimes being partners with those so treated. You had compassion on those who were put into prison and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. See, our hope we hold fast without wavering. See, that's the thing. We have this hope in Christ Jesus and we hold fast, even if it means that the plundering of our property, we can, in some sense, joyfully accept it. Um, a reference to James 1, count it all joy when you encounter various trials. You know that it has its perfect result. This is the result. You know you have a better possession, an abiding possession. That's a reference to 2 Corinthians 5 about the tent. If this tent is destroyed, we have an, a perfect and abiding tent in heaven, not made with hands. Therefore, 35th verse says, don't throw away that confidence. It has a great reward. You have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. God's faithful who promised. This is the other shoe to drop. Remember, he said, let us hold fast our confession, for he who promised is faithful. Here's the other shoe. You need endurance. Hold fast the confession, so that when everything has been done, you'll receive that promise. We need endurance, and we'll revisit endurance. But endurance begins the teaching the Hebrews Teaching of endurance begins here. It starts with faith in God. It starts with looking at the lives of those who trusted in him their whole lives and, well, eventually obtained a blessing or maybe never saw it in their lifetime, but were made perfect together with us when the fullness of Christ came so that you can endure. That's the context. For yet a little while, 37 continues, 
And the coming one will come and not delay, but my righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed. We are of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Remember he said, we draw near with hearts sprinkled in blood with full assurance of faith. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, conviction of things not seen. What we mean is faith is being sure of what you hope for, being convinced of what you don't see. That's all it means. Faith in God is trust. It's just trust. He said it was so. You haven't seen it, but you believe him. It's so. Are you sure? I'm sure. Because God said so, and God is sure. That's what faith is. That's all it is. By this, the people of old received their commendation and implies today we also receive commendation in that way. By faith, we understand the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. And that's the end of the lesson. Thank you for your attention. But um, this is important. That being convinced that what God says is true, being sure that this is what's going to happen, leads to an understanding that the universe was created by the word of God. An understanding that what is seen was not made from things that are visible. What we're saying by this, more than just the rudimentary, although it's true, physical reality is in some sense an illusion. Spiritual is the real real. <laughs> but no, what we're really saying is everything you see here, there's a spiritual truth behind this. It fits into the fabric, into the story of God somewhere. The things that are seen were not made out of things that can be seen. And this helps you to endure in life. You know that suffering is, well, it's from Satan. And its purpose is to throw you off course and discourage you and keep you from serving God. But don't let it. Draw near to God. Hold fast your confession. And be busy about building one another. What can I do to build? Understand the universe was created by the word of God. You have that power, the word of God, in, in your heart. Think of how powerful you could be. Think of the good that you can create in this world. You see magicians do little tricks, you know, where uh, they make a flower sprout or something, but you have much greater creating power than that as a Christian. The word of God brings about so many wonderful things. It's water in the desert. If today you're not a Christian child of God, we've read already what it is, what it takes. If you believe in him, if you trust in God, no, it's not me. It's not, you know, my family. It's not my interpretation, my tradition, what the church is. It has nothing to do with any of that stuff. And by, by the way, pay no attention to any of that stuff, please. I beg the churches, stop paying attention to that. It doesn't matter. What God says in the Bible matters. Put your trust in God. But if you trust him, be baptized in the name of Christ. Get for yourself the sprinkling in that blood of the covenant. Agree with God that you're going to live right from now on and live for him. Are you a Christian who has fallen away from the Lord? You need to repent. Come back before it's too late. It is a terrifying thing, and God does mean business when it comes to judgment. You know, what can we do to help? I don't know. There may be nothing we can do to help if you already know the truth, but make up your mind. Think about your situation. If you need our prayers today to overcome temptations, we're happy to do that. If you need our prayers, if you need to obey the gospel, whatever your need in the spirit is, we stand ready to help you. Please let your need be known now by coming to the front while we stand and sing.